If you've learnt nothing at all from the studies that we've been doing in the book of Revelation, I think that those of you who've been here for most of the studies will have at least learnt one thing. Or, perhaps more accurately, you will have heard me say it often enough that you will have not forgotten it. And that is that the book of Revelation, whatever else it might be, is fundamentally a pastoral book. It is a book designed to encourage and strengthen the faith of God's people when times are tough. That's what it, in the various different parts we've considered so far, at each point that is what it has been seeking to do. Now, last time we looked at the first five verses of chapter 14. And we saw that the first five verses of chapter 14 are an answer to what has been described in verses in chapters 12 and 13. In chapter 12 and 13, uh, in this symbolic language which John uses, he describes the opposition uh, that God's people face while they live in this world that the devil knows that his time is short and he uses every possible resource he can and focuses it very often in on individual believers to try and destroy their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and we saw in chapter 13 in particular the tremendous enemies uh, that we face. This trinity of evil that was described for us uh, in chapter 13. So that when we came to the first five verses uh, of this chapter, we saw that what John was seeking to do was to comfort those who felt, help! How can I cope? How will I sustain my faith in the face of such antagonism and hostility as has the spiritual powers of darkness uh, behind it to seek to uh, destroy me and my faith. And what John said very simply in those first five verses is God is faithful. He cares for his children. He will look after them. He will ensure that whatever dangers that they face whatever opposition that comes against them, uh, they will be kept for the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. Now, in the second part of chapter 14, the theme has not significantly changed, but the focus has changed. Whereas chapter 13 focused upon the spiritual opponents, this trinity of evil that are opposed to God's people. Uh, In chapter 14, the emphasis falls far more upon those who are the agents of evil, those who are used by the trinity of evil, the children of the beast. Or we might put it another way, the unbelieving world, which seeks to oppose the Christian faith in different ways. Uh, And that focus uh, is... Again, so the focus is now upon those who are used to seek to destroy, to seek to uh, undermine. Uh, And we see that this is again expressed within the context of a pastoral need. Verse 12, what is described, we're told, calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Uh, So the the, the pastoral concern is still there. The pastoral concern to help God's people face up to and be confident in the face uh, of the enemy. Now, first of all, I want you to to direct direct you to the second angel, verse 8. You notice that John saw these three uh, angels and the second one says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine 
of her adulteries. John is using symbolic language again. It's language that his first readers would have understood. The reference to Babylon is a reference to the unbelieving world. Uh, and what the second angel says is, very simply, there will be an end. Whatever dangers we face, the, evi- the, Im- the inevitable and imminent end of the present world order is guaranteed. Remember when you were at school, and most of us are old enough to, have, to remember this, we had to learn grammar. You know? Um, we had to learn about verbs and nouns and the different types of verbs. Um, past and present and future and the different types of past and present and future. Remember future historics and future perfects and all those sorts of things. Uh, and if you're like me, you didn't understand them at the time and might not even understand them now. Um, but there was one form of the verb that was never mentioned to you or to me. It was something called the aorist. Now the aorist is a peculiar form of the verb that only occurs in Greek, in ancient Greek. Um, and John uses, the angel speaks, aorists in verse 8. So you say, big deal, what does that mean? Well, the aorist conveys a number of things, but here uh, it is intended to convey certainty. It's a a, a verbal form that can convey certainty. Uh, So that when fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, the emphasis is upon that this is something that is certain. This is guaranteed. It's guaranteed by God. Simply and briefly... The world order as we know it that is opposed to us and all God's people will have an end. That's the first point that is made. But then look at verses 9 to 11. The second angel, or the third angel rather, uh, who speaks a word of judgment against those who are the children of the beast and what verses 9 to 11 tell us is not only that the end of the world order is certain but also the righting of wrongs and the judgment of God upon the unbelieving world is also guaranteed the language here is powerful language Uh, it's very strong language it speaks of God's fury and it uses a Greek word thumos, thumos uh, from uh, which we get tumult, uh, and, and it emphasises uh, a very passionate anger. The language too is drawn here, uh, burning sulphur, from a story that, if you think about it, you know very well. Where else in the Bible do we have references to uh, the burning sulphur? Sodom and Gomorrah the story of Sodom and Gomorrah the language from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, which was a byword for the judgment of God uh, in the Old Testament times in the ancient world is here used and applied here the language emphasises that folk will come be brought face to face with the one that they have spurned Uh, as you go through this uh, the emphasis lies upon the fact of their own commitment to a worldview and to a master other than God himself and John uses language that emphasises they will have to live with that reality for eternity there is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image uh, they will live Uh, with the full recognition of the folly that they have committed while God's children verse 13 will enjoy peace and rest verse 13 yes says the spirit they will rest from their labour again very simply then what John says here is that there is a time when this present world order will be brought to an end and, and, own, and those who have willingly chosen the path of rebellion against God will experience the full consequences 
of that rebellion. One of the disadvantages of preaching through the scriptures, section by section, as I tend to do, is that I end up having to preach on passages of the Bible that I would prefer not to. I don't want to preach sermons about the coming judgment of God. Uh, it's not. It, I suppose it's partly because I'm a softy, but then. All of us ought to be softies, didn't we? None of us should delight uh, in declaring the judgment of God, uh, the fate of unbelievers. Uh, I think sometimes our preaching has uh, almost glorified uh, in judgment, and that's wrong. Uh, when Jesus proclaimed his words of judgment against Jerusalem, he did it with tears in his eyes. And in a sense, this passage does the same. Because look at verses 6 and 7. I've deliberately left the first angel's message till the last. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory. Why? Because the hour of his judgment has come. In the very face, of the judgment of God uh, an angelic being goes out to proclaim the gospel still to those who are willfully in rebellion against God he does so in order that they may re respond to his overtures it's an act of incredible mercy though unbelievers will experience the judgment of God if they persist in their willful rebellion against God yet we do not have God here stamping his feet and getting cross and waving his arms around we have a God who in the very face of judgment is patient and merciful and gracious and seeks to seek and, and, and seeks those uh, who are still lost the picture therefore and it's one that we must always teach is that when God enters into judgment, when he establishes his justice, uh, it is only after long suffering and mercy and his gracious provision of the means of grace to find the way back to him that he proclaims in the very face of the judgment that he must necessarily bring because he is a holy God who must at length respond in wrath to those who persist in rebellion against him, who engage in those activities that deny him as creator. And actually we wouldn't want any other God. That's the reality. When folk complain against God's justice, a God at judging the world, they're the very first people to say, but why is God not doing this or that or the other to bring justice to the world? Uh, it's a question of world view, as we've already shared this morning. So what John is doing here is communicating a, a message of judgment. Uh, he's com com communicating a message of judgment to encourage God's people but he's conveying that message of judgment in such a way as to reveal the tender heart of the God uh, who, must, who must at length judge. One of the things that we were discussing during the week in my conference at Berlin were the various theories of the atonement. The atonement is the way by which God in Christ makes us his friends again. There have been various ways of uh, describing that down the centuries uh, and one of the theories is known as the moral influence theory it says very simply this that if you and I are presented with a love of God in Jesus we will simply want to love God uh, we don't need to know all the details of how exactly uh, the atonement took place actually God changes our hearts simply by warming them in the face uh, of the gospel of Jesus now there's an element of truth in that 
it's not the whole truth, it's not an adequate explanation of what, about what Jesus did on the cross. But actually in this passage, in a sense, that's what God is doing. He's saying, look what a beautiful God I am. Even in the face of persistent, willful, ongoing rebellion, I am ready to welcome and receive uh, unbelievers in the very face of the day of judgment itself. Uh, so how do we apply this passage? Well, first of all, that very fact should encourage us as we share with others to bid them to come and welcome Jesus. To see what a gracious and loving God is the God of the Bible. Uh, how he has displayed uh, before a watching world uh, his compassion, his tenderness, his mercy and his loving kindness. How he loves us and wants us to be his children. Uh, and it ought to encourage us, to encourage others uh, to nurture uh, a faith in him. But this passage is primarily for us as believers. It's to encourage us to faithful endurance. Yes, there are many forces, individuals, organisations, structures uh, in the world in which we live that are opposed to us and may sometimes be very specifically opposed to you or me. And that opposition occurs because we are God's people. It wouldn't occur otherwise. It is precisely at the point that we stand for Jesus that that opposition comes. And it's a powerful opposition. But the reassurance of this passage is, powerful though it is, uh, we are to be faithful in our endurance because the passage ends with verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, said the Spirit, they will rest from their labours and their deeds will follow them. It's a rule in uh, any court, isn't it? Uh, that uh, y you prefer more than one witness. The Old Testament said that truth is established when there are two witnesses. Uh, uh, we might sometimes think that sometimes more than two is required. Notice here there are three witnesses. To the rest, that is guaranteed to us. I heard a voice from heaven. When John hears a voice from heaven, it's normally God himself speaking. I heard a voice from heaven. John himself bears testimony to what he heard. And then the Spirit says, Amen. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labours. So if you or I have any doubts that when we're faced with hostility and opposition in the name of Christ when the world drags us through this difficulty or that we have the voice of John we have the voice of the Father and we have the attesting echo of the voice of the Spirit to say we will find rest we will find rest. Not we may find rest. The Spirit doesn't say they may rest from their labours. We, they will rest from their labour. And so as God's people we have to go forth in confidence. Yes, the opposition that faces God's people is immense. It tends to be more subtle in the Western world. It can be far more aggressive and hostile and obvious in other parts of the world. Uh, we face enemies. We face the trinity of evil who are opposed to each one of us individually. Uh, we face those who have been raised up and who identify with the trinity of evil and will do all they can uh, and will be willing partners with the trinity of evil to work uh, to destroy our faith and our witness. But God's testimony through John to the first century church and every other church since is 
God is on the throne. He will protect his people. Uh, he will ensure their deliverance. He guarantees that they will enjoy the blessings of the kingdom to come. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, there are those times when we are led through the most painful of times and the opposition that we face we cannot but see as driven by those who would seek to destroy our witness. That can be true as individuals, it can be true as a community, it can be true in all sorts of ways we are not unmindful of the opposition we face we thank you for John's testimony that he's very blunt and straightforward uh, in his description of the dangers and the enemies uh, that we will encounter but we thank you that just as he spoke with authority uh, to a suffering church and a church that considered itself weak and in danger 2,000 years ago those same words apply to us we thank you that we will find rest we thank you that the victory uh, may not be ours but is certainly his and he will bring us together with him uh, into your everlasting kingdom as trophies of his grace so we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the encouragement and strength that you grant to us through your word, by your spirit, through the testimony of Jesus. Hear our prayer, we ask in his name. Amen.